Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's coverage of reInvent, our 11th year. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We're here in the MongoDB Emerald Lounge. Emerald Lounge, Lounge. Yeah, Emerald Lounge. City. Lounge. This is the sugar cane. <laughs> this, is, this is the sugar cube. Okay, the sugar cube <laughs> and the sugar cane as we say. Uh, we've got David Chier, CEO of MongoDB here. Thanks for hosting us here with theCUBE. We really appreciate it. John, Dave, thank yeah, you for having space. me. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, awesome. Well, we've chatted at your event in New York. Uh, Genera AI was on the conversation space then. Now Amazon's laid their cards down on the table. Um, data's really important. And, it, and they led with storage <laughs> on the keynote. So. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> obviously uh, everyone uses storage. Um, um, our relationship with Amazon though is really strong. Um, you know, our, just to give you some facts, our self-serve business through them in the marketplace has grown 5X over the last 18 months. Um, we're deployed in 29 regions around the world, so we're in every Amazon region. Uh, we have thousands of customers of all shapes and sizes using us on top of AWS. Um, we're uh, working closely with them on a bunch of new capabilities, um, um, uh, on offering new services for our customers. Um, our teams in the field are working really well together, and so the relationship is, uh, is, uh, is going well. The culture at Mongo is evolving. The presence here at reInvent is bigger every year. Yeah. So I think it's the second year you have the, the, this restaurant kind of bought out, you got the big booth on stage. Talk about the, um, how Am uh, Amazon and Mongo's relationship from a cultural standpoint. It's a faster pace of play now in this te tech game with AI where data is the centerpiece of all the conversations and architecture. Well, I think in the early days, you know, Amazon was very focused on developing its own first party services, but over time they realized partners like MongoDB can drive a ton of business and collectively we can solve some very interesting problems for customers and so that relationship has really blossomed. Um, we just struck a, a new strategic relationship with them earlier this year. Uh, we're on, on both go-to-market, product, and just general kind of uh, you know, uh, integration of services. So we feel really uh, good about the relationship. Uh, we've actually been to this restaurant since 2018. We first did it in a renegade way where we just uh, we never bought out the restaurant and then uh, now it's become a core part of the reInvent show. And, and it's a great site, right? It's in the middle of the traffic, people going back and forth to the show. You've had a pretty amazing business momentum. I remember when we talked last year at reInvent, interest rates were rising. Uh, you had made the case to Wall Street that look, we're, we're a transactional app, it's critical to business, so we're not as, as prone to some of the optimizations that are going on, even though you're optimizing, your customers are optimizing. I remember I talked to some customers in here, they were like, we love Mongo, we're, we're up for renewal, we're going to take it in little you know, bits and pieces. So you guys have managed through that very well as evidenced by your last quarter. So that premise, I think, has come true. Increasingly, you move into sort of the, the world of analytics. You're expanding Mongo, and you've basically got a very small share of a very large market. How do you think about sort of your, your place in the TAM? Yeah, so our whole focus is in enabling developers to do more. So we're not trying to be a data warehouse or some analytics platform for a BI user. Uh, we're really focused on, on enabling developers to do more sophisticated analytics as part of building very intelligent applications. Uh, we, as you know, we introduced vector search, and the reason developers are flocking to it is, is as AI becomes more democratized, as it moves left, away from the you know, machine learning engineers to developers really embedding AI to make apps smarter, um, it's having a real profound effect. And the reason they gravitate to MongoDB is that the usability of all these capabilities is very well crafted so that the developers can just get the technology out of the way, that they can just do their work. They don't have to kind of clunk through and kind of meander through a bunch of point tools. They can really use a very seamless platform to be able to move fast. And in a world where customers are being asked to do more with less, the best way to do that is to make your developers more productive because you're not necessarily going to grow your team by 30%, but if you can make your developers more productive by 30, 40%, all of a sudden, you, by definition, you have 30, 40% more capacity. So I presume you saw the Retool survey. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, go retool.com. Retool is like a software development platform to develop business apps, and they did a great survey of I think 14 or 1,500 developers and I was shocked. They said, you know, which, which vector database are you using? You guys haven't even GA'd yet, and you were as popular as Pinecone, but your NPS was off the charts. So obviously the developers are, are trying it, they're downloading it. We use Mongo, we use a separate, we actually use Milvis, open source, and so we, we, we want to sort of 
think about that, pitch us on why <laughs> we should be using vector search in Mongo. What, what are the benefits of there, and why are developers taking it up so quickly before it's even announced at GA? Well, the analogy I'd use is with products like the iPhone or like Tesla, it's not like there aren't other phones or other cars, but how it's all packaged together in a way that's so compelling and so user-friendly and enables people to do what they want to do is essentially what differentiates MongoDB. So yes, there's other vector you know, point tools out there, but it's very clunky for a developer to basically connect their vector data to their metadata to their core data, be able to orchestrate all that, then figure out how to do the embeddings and all that. It just becomes a very convoluted process. We made that so much easier. And you're right, we're not even GA, but the demand from customers has been off the charts, and so we're really excited about the opportunity. Now I do want to say it's early days, you know, like I don't yeah. want to, people suddenly to think like uh, there's suddenly going to be an inflection point in our business, but the fact that people are gravitating to MongoDB, it makes us feel good about you know, where the market's going and that they're going to think of MongoDB first as they think about building AI apps. Well John, I, I don't know if you saw, only 20% of the survey respondents were actually using a vector database. So I was actually yeah. proud. <laughs> well, we, we're one of the 20%. Well, but, well there's so. a lot of things going on in vector data. Is it distributed? Can I do it on my machine? And then, right. is, it clo is it working with my data store? We talked to Sahir, I talked to my Google Next about this. Um, even though that we use an open source version, we're going to put it with the data store, mainly because of what we saw in the keynote today, when you see things like Agents, and uh, the Q product that they showed. The dots connect when you want to take advantage of that, those, those workflow automations by having the embeds, which essentially is post-ingest value. Yeah, one of the other things that I think differentiates MongoDB is, the usability is very good because think about it, like your vector data is just one subset of the data. Like, so if I imagine, you, you know, say you, you and your family are looking for a new house and you, and you see a picture of a beautiful house, you can do a search in MongoDB saying, I want to find out is there any house like this within 10 miles of this you know, zip code. Now, so you're marrying vector data with geospatial data, mm -hmm. right? And that you're doing it all in one platform, yeah. right? or you're seeing a, a wonderful image, you want to say, hey, who's the photographer who took that photograph, and I want to see what kind of other work they do. So you can do very sophisticated analytics with your vector data. So those kind of sophisticated queries is what really developers are excited about when they use MongoDB. So if I asked you um, on an earnings call, and they don't really ask these technical questions, but if I said, okay, I get Atlas, what is Atlas vec uh, ve uh, vector search, search, and what is search nodes? How does it all work together? What's the difference between them? Why should I care? So, vector search is essentially enabling you to uh, essentially you know, create vectorize your data in a very seamless way and then essentially use things like uh, RAG to basically marry your private data with your public data to get more accurate results from a large language model. So that's why people are very interested. So the search nodes is the ability to scale up and down your search uh, nodes depending on the use case of your app. So if you have a very search intensive use case, you can scale up your search now without having to scale up the rest of your cluster. So you get much better price performance in your architecture so that we offer these kind of fine grained tools for customers to figure out how they want to kind of really you know, build their app and what kind of performance levels they want to offer to their customers and we do it in a very cost effective way. I think the search, that, this whole search thing concept around um, this general AI is interesting because it changes the game. It's multi-dimensional and the apps are now going to take advantage of it. So how do you guys see, what's your vision for how you guys are going to enable this next gen level app market? Because low code, no code's coming, we see that and it's still going to shift left with developers. What is going to be the lingua franca for developers when it comes down to enabling them to do apps? Well, I think you're going to see a, a bunch of threads, right? Obviously with code generation tools, you're going to see developer productivity increase pretty dramatically. So that the scale and ambition of the, well, the kinds of workloads they want to take on will just go to the next level. I think you're going to see them obviously into embed more intelligence into these applications, um, whether it's you know, driving um, automation or productivity, et cetera. And then I think what you're also going to see is people looking at their legacy platforms and saying, I need to migrate my legacy platforms to an architecture that could kind of position me and future-proof me for AI. And so you're going to see a lot of customers, and we're investing a lot of tooling to enable customers to more easily you know, migrate from their legacy relational platforms to a more modern platform to position themselves for an AI future. Is that Necess does that imply the cloud or not necessarily? Because you play in both places. Are you seeing a demand from customers to, to build, to apply Gen AI to their data that's on-prem? Yes, I mean, so obviously we have 
nearly 50,000 customers, um, right. you know, from the largest company in the world to two guys in a garage. Um, what we're seeing is a lot of customers, especially large customers, who have regulatory constraints of what they can do in the cloud, or they have such you know, um, uh, infrastructure, sunk costs, that for them it makes sense to keep using that infrastructure because it's already paid for. So what we've heard loudly from customers, they love the optionality. They love the optionality of using MongoDB on-prem and then future-proofing it for the cloud or starting on the cloud and going multi-cloud, either staying on one platform or using multiple platforms, different apps, or in some cases using the same app on different uh, uh, clouds because they need the geo diversity of not being on one, only one region and say from one part of the world, so that region goes down, they're, you know, they're in trouble, they can basically have diversity in a certain part of the world across diff two different cloud providers. Mm. So that, that gives them such a range of options, of optionality, that they really value doing that on MongoDB. So my final question for you is, what's the strategy going forward? Obviously, you have a good bet, developer productivity, that's your target. You're not trying to be some sort of data thing all over the place. Developer first, platform with Atlas. Obviously, you're seeing the dots connect with generative AI and what's possible with agents and other kind of co-pilot things. What's your strategy to run the business going forward? Our strategy is said very simply, is to enable a broad set of use cases across a broad set of deployment models, right? Back to on-prem, edge, and to the cloud, and also multi-cloud, and a broader set of use cases, so we're just increasing the aperture of the use cases we can address. We talk about search, vector search, time series, you know, there's a whole host of use cases that we're supporting, because we want to make it so easy for developers to think of MongoDB to address any problem they want to solve across any deployment model. So those are basically workloads that, right, that you're attacking. Yeah. You don't have to necessarily, who knows, you may go out and buy some companies from a technical but it's not like you have to buy companies to, to increase your TAM. No, right? we have, I mean, we're going after one of the largest markets in enterprise software. There's no lack of TAM right. for you. And it's interesting to see, because you see the analytic and the BI guys, they're trying to bring in the transaction data. Yeah. You're the transaction side, and, and as you described before, you just want to make it easier for your developers to, to do analytics with the yes. data that you have today. Correct. So your TAM is, like, I don't know, 100 billion. I mean, it's like enormous. Yeah, we have a, you know, obviously, I wouldn't say we'd never do M&A if we see an yeah, opportunity yeah, where we can build versus buy faster, yep. um, but we're always looking to innovate quickly, and that's, and obviously, in this market, that now there's more op opportunities to look at some technologies and teams that may not have been possible a couple years but, ago. But you don't have to pay 28 billion for Splunk, as and an no. example. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's why I asked the culture question. I want to come back to that, because I want to circle around, because if you look at the history of Mongo, it's always been a developer culture, okay, but now you're becoming so big and growing so fast. How is that managing internally with the team as you add more people, you're going faster? I mean, you see Amazon's announcements, you're being pulled into that vortex of this new wave. So, again, TAM's expanding, that's great, check but now you got your teams, global, global team, what, what's, how is the our, culture? Our biggest challenge, I would say, is uh, there's a big difference between being well-known and known well. So a lot of people think they know MongoDB because they tried MongoDB three, four, five, six years ago, but they have no idea, many of them have no idea what we're doing today, and especially at the senior levels, maybe because they weren't developers using document databases, they still have a very relational mindset. So we know that we have to constantly educate them on why a modern platform like MongoDB is so much more compelling in terms of scale, flexibility, performance, and agility versus, and security. It's simplicity versus, too. And simplicity yeah. Yeah. versus you know, the existing platforms. Mm. I guess I have one more final question since we've got a one more minute left. The theme here is price performance. We're now shifted back from solutions. Price performance speeds and feeds, go to solutions. Now we're back to how much it's going to cost me over time in the systematic rollout of a platform and what's the performance of it down to the chip level. So what's your uh, reaction to that? How do you see that going forward? Is this going to be more of the same, continue to be a cost performance uh, Well, we, we hear a couple things from customers. One, innovate, they still need to innovate. Two, AI's the center of everything they're thinking about. And three, they need to do it in a very cost effective way. So the ROI bar for making investments has definitely gone up. So that's why actually in some ways we feel that we think that helps us longer term because people are tired of using these you know, single point solutions for every single use case, and then they look at their data architecture and it's a complete yeah. mess. It's very costly, very complex, yeah. and very cumbersome. And so being able to do vendor consolidation on a more modern platform is something that, that I think is going to you know, be big, good for us. When you have these big inflection points, it kind of flips the script. Data management, how you do data, how you develop with data, 
in your wheelhouse, and you got yeah. a great focus. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, Dave. Great, great, to great to see you guys. And thank you for hosting us today. In oh, your our pleasure. Excellent space in Primo, Primo Real Estate. <laughs> um, our pleasure, okay. thanks for having me. Dave Vellante's here with me, you got Kelly, uh, Kelly Kramer's here, Rob Hof, Mark Out. Team coverage on the ground here with theCUBE and SiliconANGLE, bringing the best editorial content as part of reInvent. Stories go to siliconangle.com. We got a big featured story out there, breaking analysis going on. We got videos hitting, and we got a live stream out of our Palo Alto office, SuperCloud 5, special edition. We'll be right back after this short break.